Welcome to Leaders of the West, a podcast for innovators and change makers. I'm your host, Jesse Jarvis, the founder of Of the West, and I'm sitting down with agriculturalists, entrepreneurs, executives, and everyone in between with the goal of digging into the strategies, mindsets, and lessons that have been crucial to the success of ag and Western. Whether you're carrying on the next generation of your family's operation, starting something from scratch, or determined to climb up the leadership ladder, we're going to inspire you to continue to dream big, growing not just you, but the future of agriculture and Western as a whole. Let's go. Okay, I promise we're going to get to today's episode, but before we do, I have to share the coolest message that I received from an employer recently who used the site to hire their newest employee. Here it goes. My overall experience with Of The West Job Platform was beyond my expectations. We received over 70 applications for our hiring position and ended up interviewing multiple amazing candidates. We also had an abundance of valuable candidates apply for our internship position as well. Of The West is a great online portal for candidates to search for jobs and for recruiters to find the best talent available in the industry. Thank you, Of The West. Rodeo Life Magazine. Oh my gosh, you guys. So now I'm going to ask you, if you're an employer and you haven't used the site yet, What are you waiting for? The process is easy, it's affordable, and you have the potential to reach some really great candidates who love ag and the Western way of life. And if you're not an employer, you know, you might know of somebody who's looking for a new employee or looking for a new job or looking to connect with a freelancer or a contractor over on the directory. And your willingness to tell people about Of the West makes a massive impact on our business. That word of mouth stamp of approval is the business version of 24 karat gold. I kid you not. No form of marketing beats genuine word of mouth and it does not go unnoticed. So thank you guys for sharing of the West with all of your family and friends. We always appreciate it. And thank you to our valued employers for sending in those kinds of words about our platform. It is so appreciated. As always, you guys can go to ofthewest.co to find your next job, employee, or business to contract with. That's ofthewest.co. I am happy to have you guys back for this week's episode of Leaders of the West. Today, we are sitting down with Mesa Pate. I am sure you guys know exactly who Mesa Pate is. In case you are unfamiliar with her, she is, how do I even begin to explain her? Honestly, she is an incredibly talented horsewoman, rodeo athlete. She is a bucking bull stock contractor or was a bucking bull stock contractor. Like she really truly is a cowgirl in every single sense of the word. She and her mom, Tammy Pate, they created Art of the Cowgirl. And then unfortunately, back in December of last year, Mesa's mother, Tammy, passed away from a very long, hard-fought battle of cancer. So today's episode, we talk a lot about Mesa's upbringing, which is very, very unique, her and her mom's relationship, all of the changes that Mesa has been through in the last few years, becoming a mom, losing her own mom, selling Art of the Cowgirl, and then Mesa is still on the Art of the Cowgirl team. And there are some great changes that are coming to that event for 2025. So we're going to talk a lot about that as well. It is a long conversation, but you guys, it is so worth it. There's a reason that I invited Mesa to be on the show. And throughout this episode, she proves exactly why that is. She is just such a wealth of knowledge for somebody who is so young in her early 30s, who's been through so much, especially recently. She really is just one of the greatest people, and I am so honored to get to share her with you guys. So here we are, the one and only Mesa Pate. Mesa, I am so honored to have you here today. You and I, I feel like we've been connected for quite a while now, but I don't actually know that we've ever met in person. You were here earlier this summer, kind of in our area for a ranch rodeo and a horse roping that my husband almost always goes to. And for whatever reason this year, we weren't able to make it. And I was like, dang it, she was 30 minutes away and I absolutely missed out on seeing her. So it is so good to see you now, even though our listeners don't get to see you. But you guys are in for a real treat and we're going to talk about some really fun stuff. Obviously, Art of the Cowgirl and just all that you have been through in the last year. But I feel like most people probably know you. But in case somebody is unfamiliar, who is... Mesa Pate. Tell us all about yourself, your upbringing, kind of how life has taken you down the road that it has and where you're at now. Yeah, it truly feels like we should know each other personally. And I'm so bummed that I missed you guys and Bruno. And that is, first of all, such a cool event. And it's the first time I'd gone. And 
I'm very jealous of everybody who lives in that area because it's truly a special place in the world. Like, very, very cool. Well, come on over. You're always welcome. <laughs> well, thank you. You might, uh, when me and my little feral child show up all the time, you might regret <laughs> that. But yeah, so my name is Mesa Pate. I was born into a multi generational Montana ranching and rodeo family. I was raised by horse trainers. My parents, my dad started out, he worked on ranches for my whole childhood and then got the opportunity to be a technical advisor on the movie The Horse Whisper, along with Buck Branneman. And that just kind of really, like he had been riding a lot of outside horses and had really developed a passion for horsemanship and cult starting. And that really kind of opened a lot of doors into this whole world of being a clinician. And that was our life. You know, we homeschooled me and I have an older brother named Ryle. My mom loaded us up in the truck. We each had a horse. We usually had a few dogs and we traveled the country and the world. My dad would do horse training clinics and demonstrations. He worked for Perina and Prefert for most of my childhood. Yeah, so I grew up seeing the country and getting to see a lot of different horses, a lot of different people. And then we always, you know, our home base was always Montana. And then we also had a couple of properties in South Dakota and my parents were just always kind of gypsies. Like they gave us a very wonderful life growing up. And then as I got into high school and started high school rodeoing, I got really into the buck and bull industry. And that just turned into a big passion. I don't even know what that stemmed from. I mean, we always watched the PBR as a family and it was just kind of always something that we were into. And I just got really into the bull side of it. And I'm a researcher. Like if I get into something, like I get pretty obsessed with it. So I just started researching the bucking bull industry and found, you know, beyond the main events of rodeo and PBR, there's a whole other world that encompasses the bucking bull industry. And I just fell in love with it. So I went to school. I went to college in Texas. You know, we homeschooled all this whole time. I talked my mom into letting me graduate early. I moved to Texas when I was still 17 and I got into the bucking bowl business and it was funny. Things just kind of lined up and I bought a set of cows from Bob Tallman with a partner that was a friend of my grandpa's that I like pitched this whole bucking bowl business to. And I bought a set of cows from Bob Tallman, who my dad had known. He, my dad was a rodeo announcer back in the day and he had gone to one of Bob's announcing schools and they had stayed friends. So I bought these cows from Bob and he sent a bull that had knocked a hip down and sent him up for me to breed these cows to. And he said, you know, buck him, breed him, said, I think he'll get over this, this injury. Just do whatever with him and we'll partner on him, whatever you want to do. So I breed this bull, you know, I have him for about a year. I bring him to Texas and I start bucking him and he's just outstanding. So I end up taking him to some local deals and I'd just kind of gotten my feet wet and it I was I didn't know I didn't know anything. Like it's a miracle I survived like the first couple years in the bucking bull industry. But <laughs> we named this bull Highway 12 because we were moving this bull and these cows down the road one day and he kept turning back and my dad ended up roping him on Highway 12. So that's how he got his name. And anyways, he just kept getting better and better and I got some good videos of him. And I just kind of walked up to Cody Lambert one day and randomly at a bull riding and showed him a video. And he said, all right, bring him. And, you know, Cody Lambert was kind of like he had the say in everything for up until just a year ago, as far as the bull side of the PBR. And I bucked him in Pueblo, Colorado was the first PBR I went to. And we bucked him. I bucked him there. Literally. So this is how much I didn't know. The flank that I used to blank this bull, the first PBR I ever went to was a nylon rope halter that somebody had tied a ring into for me, like blue nylon rope halter. And uh, that was the first flank I had. And so he bucked really hard. And gosh, it's been such a long time now. He ended up like the next time I went, he was in the short round. And then by the end of the year, he was in the running for buck and bull of the year. And he allowed me like you know, having that bull, I was able to take other bulls and it just like opened huge doors. And I had actually, I bought 
Bob Tallman out of him at that point. And then I ended up selling him to Jeff Robinson. And at the time, Jeff was kind of the biggest name, the biggest stock contractor going in the PBR, but he let me keep him through the finals. And yeah, so I had that bull. He opened up so many doors for me. I was in the buck and bull industry for close to 15 years. And it just, I learned so much about event production. I got to see like really, I would say the best there is as far as putting a show on is the PBR. I was involved with DNH Cattle Company. My son's dad, he owns or he's co-owner in DNH Cattle Company. I got to put sales on. I got to see the buck and bull industry, even though I don't really have much to do with it anymore. It set me up so much for what I ended up getting into, which is, you know, event production. So long story short, uh, fast forward a long time because um, that was a long time ago now. You know, I've gotten into the cow horse. I've done some other things. And then one day my mom was like, I'm ready to start planning for Art of the Cowgirl, which is something that she had talked about for years. And my mom and I are, we've always been extremely close. My dreams are her dreams. Her dreams are my dreams. That's just how we were. That's how, how our relationship was. So she had talked about Art of the Cowgirl for a long time prior to actually starting to do it. And uh, he was like, yeah, I'm game. What do you need? And she said, well, I want you because at that time, you know, I'd gotten into ranch rodeos to the horse show deal. Like I was really focusing on my horses and that passion side of my life. And she's like, I want you to run the competition and the horse sale side. And I will take care of the art, the, you know, her whole, her idea and her dream of what that looks like. And so that was in like 2018 is when we really started getting serious about it. By 2019, that was our first, probably 2017 is when she really started planning. 2019 was the first Art of the Cowgirl and it was very scary. Didn't know what was going to happen, but it was a huge success. It's just gone from there and yeah. As they say, the rest is history. Boy, isn't it ever. Well, I will say I am just so fascinated by the fact that at 17 years old, your parents let you move to Texas and you bought cows to start off on this new adventure that you really didn't know anything about. No. and Which I will say sometimes when you do things like that, it's because we are so naive that we don't know, like looking back, oh, we would never do the things that we've actually done because now we have more information and we think like, man, how dumb was I? Or like, what an idiot was I for doing these things? But I think sometimes you do have to have just like this, like, well, I'm going to figure out a way to do it. And in a way, not knowing anything is more powerful because it allows you the courage to do things. Yeah, for sure. I mean. First of all, I moved to Texas when I was still 17. My mom came with me and I had a dorm room and like my rodeo coach literally had to tell her like, you have to leave now. (laughs) It wasn't like I drove down by myself and was just on this adventure. And no, my mommy definitely was there. And even just my parents, I don't know, there was just nothing. My mom was such a dreamer and there was no... Like there was just never any question like that you can do whatever you want to do. My dad was the practical one. And like even through like high school rodeo, you know, when I decided I wanted a high school rodeo, my dad would not let my mom go buy me a finished rodeo horse. Like he just wouldn't do it. And she's like, her family was very, they were very competitive. Her, she has two sisters and they were like the girls, the Clark girls were the girls to beat around Montana. And it didn't happen very often. And my grandpa put them on horses that gave them confidence. Like he was very, he was such a great coach. Like he just really knew how to build their confidence. And so that's my mom. She's like, you know, I just want her to go win. I want her to. And then my dad was like, no, we're not doing it that way. Like we, our foundation is horsemanship you know, she's going to have to go slow. She's going to have to get beat. She's going to have to do Basically it. make your own. Yes. And that was like, oh, I mean, Montana is kind of a tough, it's a tough state. And I so appreciate my dad for that. And I did, I did have the opportunity to ride some good horses and, and stuff along the way. But 
you know, the horses I took to college, the two horses that went to college with me were one I raised and was the only person to ever ride him. The other one, my dad started like we did everything. It, they were, I mean, everything. And then from then, almost every horse that I've rode has been the same. Like I've never gone and bought a finished horse. And it's really taught me like, you know, it doesn't look like you want it to right now, but it's going to look so much better down the road. And I have no, like I said, my mom was totally like, she wanted to go get me finished horses. She wanted me to have that confidence. So I see both sides and I'm so thankful for having both sides. But I do think like being 17, moving to Texas, East Texas from Montana, like I would not have been able to do that or had that confidence or self-assurance. Anyways, I was very naive, would not have been able to do it without my parents, just how they raised me for sure. And both personalities like set me up for success. Oh, well, and I think too, the fact of like in making your own horses, that is why you are the horsewoman that you are. And you're going to roll your eyes and say, oh, no, I'm, I'm really not. But no, you absolutely are. Your entire family is known for being incredible horsemen and horsewomen. And you don't get that from only riding finished horses. You get that from making horses from nothing into something or into, into finishing them. And I, I even see that with myself. So like, I was always given the safest horses to ride and I will never call myself a horsewoman. Like that is not my skill. My husband, on the other hand, he is an incredible horseman because he was always as a, not as a kid, like given an unsafe horse, but not necessarily given the best horses and had to figure out how to make them into what he wanted or make them into things that are better. And because of that, he is a thousand times the horse person that I am in that sense. So I totally, I understand both sides as well. There's definitely that fine balance of, especially when you have kids and small kids, obviously you want to put them on the thing that is safe because safe is what builds their confidence. And um, if they get hurt, they're never going to want to do it. But at that same time, like you have to be given challenges because challenges in life are what we learn from. Yeah. And it's funny because there is, like you say, there's positive to both sides. I, I have found like getting into the cow horse, it was so hard for me in a judged event. Training and showing are so different. Like, it's a completely different skill set to learn. Like, it was very hard to learn to train. I'm nowhere close to like being a trainer that, you know, at the league that I aspire to be. But I had a harder time learning to show. Like, I rodeoed and I didn't rodeo, just I rodeoed until I got into the buck and bull business. And that was really what I was passionate about at that time. And then I still rodeoed some after that, but it wasn't my main focus. And so it was different. When I got into the cow horse, it was like, you can't, you kind of have to, at some point, get into this mindset where, for one, it's being judged on how, not how it feels, it's how it looks. And it's very hard to go from training to showing. And I will say that people who get to ride a lot of different finished horses almost have a bit of an advantage because they know what it's supposed to feel like. Mm -hmm. I've seen so many, and not just in the horse show world. This is, I mean, barrel racers. I mean, so many performance horse men and women that I do not deny somebody's ability at all based on them being successful on a horse somebody else trained because it is not easy to go out and win in this day and age. There are so many good horses. Like, this is the best time in the horse industry, I think there's ever been like between just the quality of horses, the quality of horsemen and women, the breeding, like the responsible breeding, like everything is just as good. The money, like, I mean, it's just, I'm so excited and proud of where the horse industry is right now in a way that I just don't think I've ever been. Or, I mean, I just don't, it just is in such a good place. Like people are being so responsible and it's just, but it's so tough. Like it is so tough. So to get on something that's trained, and go be competitive is just as impressive as, you know, training one yourself. No, I am right there with you. Something that I do want to talk to you about is, obviously, we we heard about all of the highs, I feel like, of Mesa Pate in the last 15 plus years. 
the last three years have been really life changing for you in the absolute best ways and in the absolute worst ways. Comparing Mesa then to now, how do you feel like you have really changed and grown just to like navigate life as how you have? Yeah. So three years ago, I was had a newborn baby. I was still living in Oklahoma. I had my mom. You know, I was getting ready for the PBR finals and Art of the Cowgirl and all these things. And then, yeah, I came back to Montana and it wasn't too long after that that my mom, her cancer came back. And so, yeah, it's, gosh, I mean, life just never ends up exactly how you plan it. I've been really lucky to have a great family in my own family and my son's family. I've been blessed with so many people to keep me on the right track because there has been some really hard things. I'm very lucky to have a job with Art of the Cowgirl that's been a constant and kept me busy because, you know, when things are hard for me, like being busy is the best thing. But I mean, along with my son is my son, his name is Hayes, and he's he turned three years old on September 9th. And he is obviously the best thing that's ever happened to me. That being said, I went 30 years doing whatever I wanted. And my life completely changed in a wonderful way. But I mean, I think you can probably relate that when you're a woman that is very used to a certain lifestyle, a busy lifestyle, and and just being busy, kids make life very different. So that was, you know, like the first big life change, which, like I said, was the best thing that's ever happened to me. But then navigating that and then my mom getting sick again and, you know, everything with Art of the Cowgirl. And Art of the Cowgirl has been such a, like I said, such a great constant in my life. But there's always challenges with something like that. And then just going through those just day to day challenges of motherhood and work and then seeing your mom sick and, you know, she beat it before. And, you know, on one side, you just want to be like, well, she's going to beat it again. She always does. Like, there's just nothing that can keep her down. And then also, you know, just all those challenges. Yeah, it's it's been a crazy three years. No, it absolutely has. And I think, too, it's also hard to kind of do that in the public eye in the sense of your family is incredibly well known, right? Everybody has been to a clinic of some kind. and. I feel like everybody knew Tammy. And so it can be challenging, I think, to then also have to navigate those challenges in front of other people or with well-known family like that. Yeah. Like it can be great because then everybody, you have calls and texts and, you know, hey, how are you doing? And, And a wild variety of people checking in on you, which is absolutely wonderful. But at the same time, it's a very private thing. And I can imagine that that has been somewhat difficult or bittersweet is maybe a better word. Yeah, bittersweet is definitely a great word. As far as my mom goes, and I know we'll get more into that, but it wasn't really my story. It wasn't my fight. I mean, it was all of our fight, but my mom, you know, and I don't think she would ever consider herself like a public figure, which is so funny because my mom was, she did not shy away from like, did your mother know a stranger? <laughs> no, she was completely like in touch with her vanity. Like she was just, she knew how great she was. She really did. Like she was so funny, but you know, like she was okay with not being a world champion. She was okay with not being, you know, in the cowgirl hall of fame. She was just like, she was just so herself. She was just so authentically Tammy. And so I don't think it bothered her to be, you know, in the public eye because she didn't really talk about it a lot. Like she didn't make it. It wasn't ever a sad story to her. It wasn't ever like she would never let anybody and not that there's anything absolutely wrong with benefits or anything along those lines. But she's like, I have great insurance. You know, this isn't about me. Like I this is my fight. We're, you know, if somebody called and wanted to know she went the panic care out. She did a completely different, she went on her own and did her own treatment. I mean, in, in a way, she worked with oncologists. She was very, very smart, but she took calls, you know, multiple calls a week on cancer and just telling people what her protocol was, what she did, the research that she, she had it all written out, the research that she did. 
and she would just email it to whoever called and asked. And so it was in the public, but she just made it her. It just was so Tammy. Like she just made it not about her, but she just handled it in such a Tammy way. No, definitely made it. There was a bigger picture and, you know, a bigger purpose there. I will say grief is something that we've never talked about on the show. And part of that is because I personally feel like grief is a very unique thing. It is as unique as the people who are experiencing it. We are all different humans. Nobody, no two people are alike. And I think no two experiences of grief are alike, even if it's the same person having lost two separate people. Like even those walks through grief are very, very different. And I know that there are these technical like stages of grief, but again, what that looks like and feels like for everybody is very, very different. But obviously, having lost your mom less than a year ago, you are in the middle of that now. What have been some of the things that have maybe helped get you through some of those really, really hard days? Yeah, and I've thought about that a lot because I don't think that I would have handled grief the same five years ago as I have handled it now also. I'm not going to say I wouldn't have survived losing my mom, but I think that I would have definitely had to ask for a lot more help and had to have really worked hard to get out of a dark place losing my mom had it happened. So I think that's like, I wasn't going to get emotional, sorry. Um, I think that that's been like, I've tried to find like the blessing in all of this and I it's been hard. That's one, the one thing that's been really hard because it just is really hard to understand like how like the good ones just shouldn't happen to the, it shouldn't, I mean, nobody should go through cancer, just nobody. But for someone who does so much good to go through it, I just really struggle. Like just why? And I think a lot of it has to do with like, I'm in a, me, I mean, my mom and I were like, I mean, I, I'm pretty comfortable saying that we were soulmates. Like, we were just really, really close. And uh, had I not had Hayes or truly Art of the Cowgirl and work, I think that's the blessing that my mom gave me in giving me five more years because she was in remission for five years. So for me, handling grief has been very interesting because I just... In thinking about losing my mom when she was first diagnosed, because it was it was a very bad diagnosis when she was first diagnosed. And I was like, if if I lose her, like I don't know how to how I'll be able to pull myself out of that. When I did lose her, I had a two and a half year old that needed his mom. You know, yeah, you was, have to show up every day. You have to. So although it was the most devastating thing imaginable. The next day was still another day. It was right before Christmas. Like, it was right before Art of the Cowgirl. And so I'm very, very blessed. I'm blessed to have my dad, who was, it was, you know, what he had to go through also is just no husband should have to. We got to go through that together, which was, when you were in it, was just awful. But having him, I mean, it's just, he was just amazing. My family, my whole family, my friends, I just, I had so many people that just surrounded me that, and then I had work. And that's just, that's the way I grieve. I stay busy. And that's the way my dad grieves. Like we both, like we're kind of the same person, which has, you know, been challenging (laughs) over the years, but we got, we just went to work. And I don't know if like a therapist would say that healthy. But I am incredibly thankful to have had that in that season of my life. And it was work that was my mom. Like, it was what my mom created. And I got to see it through. Like, And now looking back on it, it was our last year at Queen Creek. It was so beautiful. Like, just that final, everything was just incredible. And I will say that Jamie Stoltzfus, who's with Art of the Cowgirl, was incredible through that keeping it going and just the whole you know our whole crew did such a phenomenal job not only putting the event on but you know just surrounding me and my dad and my brother and it just was it was the hardest you know time of my life but it was so beautiful to 
see like all these people that just my mom had gathered up and put there to get us through that time also. So I cannot speak for other people's grief, but I will say that somebody align God, whoever, you know, whatever force people believe in, mine was lined up to protect me in the worst time of my life to get me through it. And I think my mom had a big part in it. And yeah, it was, like I said, it was a horrible and beautiful time. And I think a lot of people who have, who have walked that walk would probably agree. And again, that's why it is so very different for everybody. On the topic, though, of Art of the Cowgirl, earlier this spring, you and your family sold Art of the Cowgirl to its new owners. And a lot of people may think like that that was a decision that was made due to your mother's passing, but it's actually something that you and your mom and your family had been working on long before any of that. And we're going to get into some specific details for the 2025 event because there's some changes and they're really exciting. Um, And obviously you are still with Art of the Cowgirl. You haven't gone anywhere and you're not going anywhere. But can you just kind of tell people a little bit more about like knowing when it's time to let something go? Because I think we probably have a lot of listeners who have built something or who've created some really cool things, you know, whether they are businesses or events and And they've considered selling those, but they don't necessarily know like how or when or if they're going to lose some of their identity with that. And can you just kind of share a little bit about that decision and kind of how you had gotten there and all of the details around that? Yes. So we did. We sold Art of the Cowgirl. And it, like you said, something that was in the works and in conversation for a very long time. It is very expensive to put an event on. And my mom did an incredible job in doing that. And she built something that was sustainable. Her deal was when she started it was she was not going to bankrupt her family. And she never, she didn't get a business loan. She did it completely without any kind of backing financially. It was her and my, and talking my dad into sticking their necks out and starting this. So she built it literally from the ground up and it got to the point where it was very sustainable, but where could it go without somebody else that was more financially secure to take it to another place or take it on the trajectory that it was going? And so that was really the big decider in that she was really at her she felt she was at the limit of what she could do with Art of the Cowgirl. And so she, you know, started talking about it, started planning for it. And I really think that when people are thinking about selling a business, I think the questions that I feel would be beneficial in asking yourself is, do you want, because her plan was really, nothing was going to really change as far as running the event the people that were interested and that she was talking to really weren't people who would want to run the event themselves. So that was for her, for her situation was a huge, that's really the only way she would do it is if she still was in control of the event and the foundation and the event are actually separate. Like you cannot sell a nonprofit. So we would always, and we still have control of the foundation. And that's also something in, you know, there's a lot of business out there that do have a nonprofit also. That's like a whole other set of challenges because like with Art of the Cowgirl, selling a, the event without the nonprofit could really make it difficult. Like because the event and the and the foundation, it was so there were so many gray areas. It was so merged. Everything was so there was no black and white with the two. So that was the first challenge. So in thinking about, you know, other businesses, that's something to really consider is if that's even possible. If you do have a nonprofit component to your business, like that is something you really need to consider and figure out how to separate those two things in a way that is good for both. So the other thing is then, you know, deciding if you want to just walk away, just you sell your business and you're done, or if that's not what you want and you just want a backer or somebody who takes on the financial responsibility and you keep the responsibility of keeping it going and keeping it a success, which comes with a lot of stresses, honestly. 
and also not having complete control is really it's really hard to let go of control of something that you've built, which I am I have learned. So with my mom, that was really I don't think she could have ever let control of it completely. Like I think and I I don't think anybody would want her to. Like I just I don't like Tammy Payne is not someone you don't want running your event, honestly. Oftentimes when people purchase businesses, they do so with the guarantee that the person, whether it is the face of the brand or the CEO or whatever that is, comes with the business. Because otherwise, if that like secret sauce walks away, then the asset that they now have is not the same value. For sure. Yeah. So after my mom passed, it was just a crazy time. And then after she passed, we didn't know what we were going to do. We were considering just keeping it and, you know, my dad and I were going to run it and Jamie and just keep going like we were. But like I said, it was sustainable, but it was going to stay in the same place. It was not going to unless and, and in this economy, like it's a very there's a lot of unknowns about the future at the moment. And so, yes, we could go another year and we were completely prepared to do that and happy to do that. And then see what happens. But, you know, like I said, this event is on a trajectory that needs to keep going. Right. I don't want to see it get like too big and out of control, but it's more about like what opportunities would be available for, you know, what it's about for these makers, for the fellowship program. Like that's where, you know, we really wanted to keep things growing for that. Well, and I think, too, it's bigger than than you or your mother. And I mean that in a very respectful way. Like when things are going to be bigger than you, then then you kind of need to like let them go so that they can continue to grow. And like you said, having somebody with just more efficiencies as far as, you know, facilities or these other areas that are the limitation, when you take that out of the equation, that is when something like Art of the Cowgirl can continue to grow. And maybe it's not necessarily bigger, but it's just the like stronger growth. Yes. Yeah. And that's the deal is where we were having to put so much money into the, you know, five day event that it, it would limit the heart of Art of the Cowgirl. So, so it was really, it was always the time. It was always the right time to do something. And then losing my mom, it just kind of rocked everybody. And then what do we do? And so, Ty approached us and it just kind of everything just kind of kept working out and working out. And yeah, here we are. And I think it's the best thing that could have happened for Art of the Cowgirl. So now here we are. There are some fun, exciting changes to Art of the Cowgirl in the coming year. First off, obviously, the dates are new. But can you tell us about what you guys have been working on so tirelessly the last, I would say, like nine months in this new event? Because a lot of things are new, but a lot of them are staying the same. So it's not like people who are who loved the old Art of the Cowgirl, if you will, are going to be disappointed because it's a completely like new and changed thing. There are a lot of those components that are still there, but there's a lot of fun, exciting things coming as well. And it's it really is the perfect like blend and I'm so excited about it and I just want you to share all of the things. Yeah. So Art of the Cowgirl was bought by Rancho Rio. Um Rancho Rio is run by Ty Yost and Ty Grantham. And I'm going to be the first to admit, like I didn't know Ty Yost. Um I'd met him. He's friends with my my mom my mom's sister is Stephanie Lyman. She's married to Rod Lyman who was an FR Bulldogger. And so through Rod I had met Ty briefly. When it sold and, and I let my dad, you know, make the final decision on what to do. And when it sold to Ty, I didn't really know what to expect. I was happy. I I really was, I was okay with anything because like, like I said, like it needed to go to somebody that could do more with it than what we were financially able. So I could not, you know, we're months into this and I've been working with the Rancho Rio crew. There isn't a better person or better group of people that Art of the Cowgirl could have been put into their hands. Like the first time that I went to a meeting at Ty's and I came home, my dad asked me how it was and what I thought. And I'm like, Ty is so much like mom. It's not even funny. Like they would have fought like crazy. (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> because they are so much alike. Like they kind are of such, like you and your dad, right? <laughs> yes, exactly. Like huge dreamers, like not afraid to go outside the box, not afraid to do things. I am more scared to go outside the box. Like I'm from an industry where there's industry standards. Like this is how it's done. This is how it's supposed to be done. My mom and I argued all the time. She's like, well, why do we have to do it that way? I'm like, because that's how that's that's the way it's done. She's like, well, that's stupid. I'm like, well, it's not stupid because it's words. She's like, no, like, why, why would you do it that way? Like, okay. So, and Ty is so like just the same energy. So it's like, it's just been like such a, a very, very cool experience. And they are obviously incredible at what they do. So to answer your actual question, I just wanted to, you know, like let people know from me, from somebody who has been there from the beginning, from the beginning of when my mom was talking about this, you know, as just a dream, as literally as nothing our, but a dream at our kitchen table, like literally, yes, Rancho Rio and this, this group of people are incredible and are going to do incredible things with Art of the Cowgirl. And I'm so proud to be a part of it. So I'm in the same position that I was. I'm still the director of the horse sale and the director of the competitions. And which is like actually pretty scary being in that role when like this is one of the best producers in the world and has been a very, very successful horse sale producer. And so I'm so excited for just a learning opportunity and to even be just trusted in that position still. Like it's very humbling and it's just a very cool, it's just been a very, very great experience. And Ty is so passionate about what Art of the Cowgirl is about and honoring my mom and honoring what she built and, you know, the heart and the soul of Art of the Cowgirl. And he's so supportive of the foundation. The foundation is still merged so beautifully with Art of the Cowgirl. It's still the heart of Art of the Cowgirl. You know, there's so much generosity from Rancho Rio and everybody involved in making sure that Art of the Cowgirl is still about, you know, enabling these makers to just go out and do great things. Like that's what Art of the Cowgirl is about, is is about ensuring the future of our industry. And so having these new owners that see that, but have like somebody in place for sponsorships and somebody in place for this and somebody in place for that, that have so much experience. Our crew, our group, like my mom had been in the industry for a very long time. She knew everybody. She never put an event on. Like I'd put on, I'd been part of putting on a, a lot of bull sales I never put a horse sale on. I never put a ranch rodeo on. Like, I can't believe I had anybody enter the second year from the first year of Art of the Cowgirl. Like, I mean, we didn't know. My mom knew everybody in the industry as far as going and asking for sponsorships. And she was not afraid to do that. But she never wrote up a contract. Like, she had signed a lot of my dad's contracts. But, you know, like having these people with so much industry experience in their respected areas is just... It's so game changing for Art of the Cowgirl and it's going to elevate it so much higher than what our very, very talented group was able to because there was just not enough of us. And we put a very big event on with a very small crew. And that was only because like, again, just the logistics. Well, and you just, I mean, it was possible because we had the greatest people in the world that believed in my mom and they're like when you're around my mom you just didn't really have a choice like you you just did what tammy said and so going forward to really answer your question like i don't see like there's been a lot of talk on like the event's going to be a lot different and everything's changing we've changed venues before like we went from you know a very small venue to queen creek and it was a huge change and it was very scary because our first venue was beautiful and was such a cool feel. And we outgrew it truly the first year. We were there for two years, but we really outgrew it the first year. And we just made it work the second year. And Queen Creek was wonderful, but it wasn't our first, it wasn't for the first venue change. So for me, that from the inside looking out, I don't see that many changes for Art of the Cowgirl other than the date. And the location. And I think the location is going to be so amazing. Like Wickenburg is such a cool cowboy town. And I think it's going to be make it more accessible for 
our world being in Wickenburg. Well, and people who are already going to Wickenburg in the winter, there's yes. obviously a massive group of people who are there. Yeah, and it's it's just such a it's such a cool town, and to be able to be a part of that community, because that's what Art of the Cowgirl is all about is community, and I feel like that is really like has the potential to be such a special home for Art of the Cowgirl and Queen Creek. Like the whole crew at Queen Creek has been amazing, and we appreciate them. Oh gosh, beyond anything, like they were just went above and beyond. And that was such a great, a great home for us for, for years. And I mean, truly, like we could have stayed there for a very long time and been very, very happy. Like it just, it was a one, that's a wonderful facility. And that crew is absolutely amazing. What's going to be so, so cool to see about Rancho Rio is them owning the facility, owning the cattle. Like there's all these costs of putting an event on that people don't understand take away from so many other things you know a facility is very expensive cattle are very expensive like it's and it's not necessarily that okay now that you don't have to spend money on cattle or or the facility that then you get to keep the money it's no we get to put that money back into other things to make the event bigger and better or cooler like it does not come from a place of greed it comes from a place of actually like wanting to give Hey, we know we can make this event better. We can make the payout bigger, what, whatever, like what have you, because we don't have these other expenses. It's being business yeah. savvy. It's not being greedy at all. No. And, and that's what it's so hard, I think, until, and I didn't know. I mean, I had no idea until you're in it, until you really understand. Mm-hmm. Like event production is fascinating for one. Like I really, I love the, that side of it. I love figuring out. And Ty Yost is like, a genius like he can sit there and da 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 in his head and like come up with numbers and like i have to have a calculator and like i don't even know what to try to figure out numbers but it's so cool to like exactly what you say like it does not come from a place agreed like this event isn't big enough to where everything's going in any like everything made is going in somebody's pocket like it is still it's a self-sustainable business and it goes back into itself Yes. And so, but the money that would have, like you said, gone to, you know, cattle, I mean, cattle, cattle is such a, people don't understand, like cattle for a horse event is a huge cost. And, you know, there's still like, the cattle are still going to be leased, but it's like, there's just so much more freedom. There's so much more. Mm -hmm. It's just going to be so cool to see what can be done in the facility and everything. Yeah, it's just, it's very cool. So what are the new dates? It has always been held in January, but now it's moving to February and March. Yes. So it will be February 25th through March 1st, with it concluding with the Ranch Rodeo Finals and the horse sale. In Wickenburg, Arizona, any other details? Yeah. So everything, like I said, you're still going to have your same. We're honoring our master's and fellowship recipients. Still an amazing trade show, still tons of educational programming as far as demonstrations, workshops, hands-on workshops, ranch rodeo is the same, horse show, four event horse shows the same, we are adding a team roping, the breakaway roping is the same, Merck has stayed on and we've been able to keep that really cool breakaway roping that has been super fun to watch grow over the years, and then our invitational horse sale. Awesome. Okay. So obviously this is airing in November. There's plenty of time for people to one, book their hotels if you need a hotel, unless you already live in Wickenburg. Buy your tickets, book your flights. Where can people go to buy tickets? Artofthecowgirl.com? Yes. Artofthecowgirl.com is where you can buy tickets, find all competition info, horse sale info. Everything is at artofthecowgirl.com. Follow us on all social media platforms. And then horse sale catalog. Are those digital only? Are they, is there a mailing list for print catalogs? If somebody wants to buy a horse that's in the sale, how can they find the info for that? So artofthecowgirl.com will have the digital catalog. We have not sent out print catalogs beforehand. There'll be print catalogs on sale at the site, but we haven't sent out print catalogs the last couple of years. Okay, perfect. Let's get to the rapid fire round. 
what is the best piece of business or personal advice that you have ever been given? So this one, I'm going to give a shout out to my dad because he made us listen to a lot of Dave Ramsey when I was a kid. And something that he really did and to this day lives his life by is live like no one else so you can live like no one else. And you know, I think that's pretty important. Like it might not look like what you want right now, but you know, it's just it's I, I'm not gonna go in debt to have a hundred and fifty thousand dollar horse trailer. I don't think it's there's anything wrong with doing that, but I get to do a lot of things that other people don't get to do. That yeah, that's kind of how the pates have always live their lives. Uh, I think that the Thompsons and the Jarvises over here, we live the exact same life. I absolutely love that. When you said that advice, I was like, I see why Kurt is the practical one. Because <laughs> yes. we are the exact same way. You guys, we still run a bobtail truck <laughs> from the 1970s. And that thing runs like a dream because we take care of what we have. And it still hauls cows the same way that any other thing that can haul cows can. And like, you just have to work smart and get scrappy. And you can have awesome stuff, the awesome yeah. stuff that we do have, because we've been able to, one, take pride in what we have and keep it going and make sacrifices in other places. I think that is awesome advice. I think the world and, and this economy really needs to hear that, too. I love that. Thank you for sharing that. OK, a slightly similar but different. This is more like the advice you want to give to other people versus the advice that's been given to you. So. If you could give people any words of wisdom and you knew that they would take it to heart, what would it be? I'm going to have to quote the great modern philosopher, Lil Wayne, on this one. <laughs> uh, <laughs> don't let failure go to your heart and don't let success go to your head. Don't let failure go to your heart and don't let success go to your head. Ooh, Lil Wayne, I love that. And I don't know if he actually said it, but I saw it probably on a quote somewhere in college. I mean, that's just like been a very like powerful, that was a powerful thing for me to, to read and it stuck with me for my whole life. I like that. If you could go to dinner with anybody, dead or alive, who would you pick? Well, obviously, I mean, my mom, but one dinner wouldn't be enough. Randomly, Anthony Bourdain. Oh, that's a... Yeah interesting choice i like it yeah i my whole family has always been very into food and i just really and travel love, obviously and travel travel and i just i've read a lot of his books i've watched his shows i just really i really like how he thought and how he looked at the world so i think that would be a very cool very cool dinner and it would probably be pretty good eaten too i was just about to say and i feel like it would be a very tasty dinner as well. Yeah. Okay. I know you gave us your little Wayne quote, but what is a quote that you lead your life by? You know, this kind of goes back to, there's two. I have two, if I can quickly. Yes. Um, this kind of goes back to the first question, a quote that, or something that I kind of align with business. And this actually came from Jan Parker, who, if you don't know who Jan Parker is, she's a powerhouse in the horse world. She runs Billings Livestock and the horse sale there. And my mom was so good about asking other people advice, like the people who have been doing it. She just, she was not too proud to ask. And I was just, she just was seeing me really struggle, like with comparing myself and just, just having a lot of struggle with the horse sale and like comparing the sale and myself to other producers and like, what does this need to look like going forward? So she called Jan and she kind of said, like, what do we like, what do we need to be doing? What should Mesa be doing? And Jan said, stay in your lane. And my mom relayed that back to me. And that, that was so impactful to me, like, especially from somebody like Jan to share that and share that kind of with a, a competitor in the industry in a way. But yeah, stay in your lane. Like, I had a vision for this. I knew the kind of product I wanted to put out into the world. I knew the kind of people I wanted to produce that product. And I'm not going to get caught up in the comparison game. I'm going to stay in my lane. And the other one, which is the most important thing to me, is keep riding forward. When you're in a jam, just always ride forward. Oh, that is all such great advice, which I would expect nothing less from you and just the wisdom that you've been able to surround yourself with, which is, which is really, really special. And in getting to share that with everybody else who's listening to this today. 
Okay, last question for you. Let's talk about your favorite things. Do you have, maybe it's a podcast or a book or a service or like a mom life hack or cowgirl life hack that you absolutely live by and swear by that you just think that more people need to know about? Oh, I don't know about any life hacks because I'm just like, <laughs> I'm just getting through every day. I thought about this a lot and and I like, I love, I'm a big reader. I love to read. And I think that especially this day and age, my favorite books is a toss up between All the Pretty Horses by Cormac McCarthy and The Time It Never Rain by Elmer Kelton. I actually listened to your podcast with Nevada Watt Miller and I was like, man, I wish that I could like listen to self-help books, but I just can't. Like I'm just a novel, like I'm a biography and story and history person. Like I love connecting with stories. Like I love hearing, I don't love hearing people's struggles, but I like, like I get more inspiration from the actual story of people's lives, even fictional. So I'm just, that's, I just love, I love books and I love, I love stories. And I think everybody right now, especially should read The Time It Never Rained because it's just a very, very, very good book. We might be sisters because I actually know for a fact my dad has every Elmer Kelton book that has ever been authored by the man or ever was authored by the man. I feel like there's nothing wrong with Louis L'Amour, but Louis L'Amour totally has like the stronghold in being the creme de la creme of Western authors. And I think Elmer Kelton is 10 times better and never got oh. like any of the credit he deserved. All of his books are fabulous. So you guys should go yeah. read them. Yeah. And that one especially like deals with so much in such a subtle, very personal to people who in this world mm -hmm. can understand. Like basically it's about a rancher in Depression era Texas during, you know, a horrible drought and just everything that comes along with that. And the writing is beautiful. The story is heartbreaking. It just deals a lot with some themes that is really still issues in our world today. And yeah, my dad, this is, he, your dad and my dad are probably very similar because I think he took that character very much to heart. <laughs> yeah, it's just, it's, it's a very good book and would, is pretty relevant for the time still. No, it absolutely is. You guys are going to, we'll make sure to include the link so you guys can go find Elmer Kelton books. They're all so good. Mesa, thank you so much. This was an amazing conversation as I absolutely knew that it would be. I am so inspired by you. You really are a rock star. You have been through so much in such a short amount of time at such a young age. You, from the outside looking in, you have done it so gracefully. I know it never feels like that from the inside looking out, but there are a lot of people, men and women out there who respect you so much for just who you are and what you've created and your strength in some of the hardest times and your family as well. But like you specifically, you really are just one hell of a woman. And I am so thankful that you took the time to sit down and chat. And I cannot wait for Art of the Cowgirl in Wickenburg, Arizona, February 25th to March 1st. You guys, first of all, anybody in a cold state, you know you've been missing out on everybody else being in warm, sunny Wickenburg, Arizona, team roping and breakaway roping their lives away. You might as well go join them, especially during Art of the Cowgirl. It's going to be a fabulous event. I'll make sure that um, we include information in the show notes. But Mesa, thank you so very much. For you guys who are listening today, please do us a favor. Share your biggest takeaway in your stories. We'll make sure to reshare it. Tag Mesa, tag Art of the Cowgirl, tag of the West. This was a really good conversation. I know it hit home in a lot of different ways for everybody. Thank you, Mesa, for being here. Thank you guys for listening. And as always, you know, you can find us back here next week with a brand new episode. If you loved this episode, do us a favor and share it with someone else who might find just as much value in it as you did. We're on a mission to continue to grow and strengthen the future of agriculture and Western industries. And you spreading the word helps us make more of a positive impact. It also makes a big difference when you take a minute to go rate and review the show. We can't thank you enough for listening, for sharing, and for loving Ag and Western as much as we do. We'll see you back here for our next episode.